depending on your exact references, you may see slightly different information. And that really zeroes in down at this oxidative phosphorylation. That production of 30 ATP is variable, depending on the uh, organism uh, doing that step. Okay? So that may be higher or lower. I think I've seen it as high as 36, and I think I've seen it as low as 28 ATP produced. So that's a pretty significant difference in the number. I think the accepted one, which we talked about last week, is 32. Okay? Um, so med schools and the pre-med pre test, MCAT test, uh, tend to push at 32 ATP, uh, not the 30 ATP as the textbook talks about. Okay? So just kind of be aware of that. That one's kind of variable. Everything else, consistent, holds true all the way through. We have direct references for those. We can uh, identify those pretty easily. And it's because how ATP is getting either produced in those steps or consumed in those steps. Those steps are very, very clear and obvious. The last one, that oxidative phosphorylation production of 30 ATP, that one becomes questionable. Okay? Depending on the organism, you'll get different results. So just keep that in mind when looking at it. What we've got on that next slide is your big summary of pretty much everything that happens in this chapter, um, chapter 17. Okay? So it shows all the individual reactions, where you're producing energy, uh, where you're making your electron carriers, your NADH molecules, um, and kind of some of those intermediates. In a full-fledged class, you're responsible for everything on that slide. Okay? You need to know the name of the compound. You need to know the name of the enzyme. You need to know where things are produced. You need to know how things are produced, all of that nasty, gory detail. Um, Take a look at the practice exam for the level of memorization that I'm going to expect out of that. Um, I tend to avoid memorization as much as possible, as you may have already kind of sensed. Um, so what you might expect to see on a test would be, here's two structures, what's happening within those structures? Okay. How is the reaction changing? So I'd give you the structures and probably the name as well. So if you went through and just memorized the name, you'd be able to answer the question based off of rote memorization or based off of looking at structural differences. Okay. So give you both pathways to be able to answer the question. So let's actually look at the nitty gritty details of going through glycolysis. So ultimately we are starting with uh, glucose. So there's really two main pathways within glycolysis. We start with glucose and we end at glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and technically a second molecule. That molecule is then converted into pyruvate. So interesting feature, what changed to go from glucose to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate? So you're saying lost a carbon. So let's be careful on that. How many carbons are in glucose? Six. How many carbons are in glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate? Do we really lose a carbon? You lost three carbons. Do we really lose three carbons? We broke it in half. Broke it in half. There's actually two glyceraldehyde phosphates. Okay. So we aren't breaking or destroying carbon okay, or releasing it even as CO2. We're cutting glucose in half. Okay. Um, so now the next question becomes is where did we cut it in half? So what bonds broke in glucose to make glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate? Carbon 3 and 4 is a reasonable guess. Okay, that's the easiest way. Otherwise, you're cutting carbons out and putting them back on and splicing and weird stuff. So our easiest process is probably cutting between carbon 3 and 4. So we're going to be cutting out there. Where else do we need to cut? Oxygen and 2, 6, or 1. Oxygen and 1. Yeah, our acetallic position. That's where we have our acetyl, or not acetyl, um, acetal. That's what I was going for. Okay, that's our acetal position. That's going to have to get cleaved. So this is something that's going to be kind of confusing as well. When we go through and look at the structures of how the textbooks organize transitioning between these, they are maintaining your sugar, your carbohydrate glucose, in the Hayworth projection and then doing chemistry to it. 
and it looks kind of vague and confusing as to what's happening within it. It's a bit odd as well because what happens to your ring? We don't have a ring anymore. We end up without a ring. So why are they showing it in the ring formation? Very likely the carbohydrate is getting processed in the ring form in all of these individual steps, getting us down to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay? So the biochemistry is happening in the ring. Is it necessarily easy to look at it the way it's happening in the cell? No, it's probably actually more difficult. So one of the things that I've added to the slides as we move through these is instead of looking at the ring structure, we'll look at the Fisher projection. So the Fisher projection and the ring structure. So if you look at the slides, I've shown you the ring structure because that's what I had quickly available uh, when I went through and built the slides and have since looked, gone back and looked at it and been like, what the hell happened in that reaction? I can't even figure it out. Oh, let me turn it into a Fisher projection. Oh, now it becomes much more apparent. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to be seeing both those versions. Okay, next point, or next interesting feature within this. We have carbon 1, 2, 3, right? So we can mark those a little bit more. There's carbon 1, there's carbon 2, there's carbon 3, then carbon 4, 5, and six. Okay, where are those carbons in glyceraldehyde? So the big ones I want to be looking for okay, would be position one, one or three, and four or six. Because once I've nailed down one or three, I know that it's going to follow in sequence. Once I've nailed down four or six, I know it's going to follow in sequence. Okay? So the question becomes is where did those carbons go in our structure? If we look to the Fisher projection for glucose, um, at least a very crude one, one, two, three, what do we have four carbon atoms? Four, CH2OH, I have no idea why it did that weird squiggle, squiggle down there. There's our aldehyde. Whoops, not that. Oh, never mind, I was right. OH. OH, OH, OH. I think I did this right. Okay, our Fisher projection of glucose. Where carbon <coughs> one is where? It's our aldehyde carbon. So there's carbon number one. So if we compare our Fisher projection now to our glyceraldehyde. Where might we predict carbon one to be? Top. Top, right? Aldehyde, aldehyde. That makes sense, except we're wrong. Carbon one on glyceraldehyde three phosphate is actually at the bottom. It's actually one, two, three. Okay. How on earth would we able to be able? Let's just try that again. How would we ever be able to figure that out? We have to go through and look at each of the individual reactions to see how that is processing through and how the structure of glucose is being altered in each of those enzymatic steps to see that that is the truth. Okay? So we may have gone through and said initially that that makes sense because we want to do the minimal amount of chemistry possible. The aldehyde should stay the same. Just keep it there. Okay? It turns out that's not true. Something else is going on within the enzyme. A lot of that something else has to do with being able to break that carbon 3, 4 bond. How easy is it to break a carbon carbon bond? Okay. They're both nonpolar atoms. <coughs> that bond is very polar or nonpolar covalent. Okay. So it's sharing electrons. That's probably the hardest bond in the structure to break. How on earth could I possibly break that bond? I'm going to have to change the chemistry around that bond to facilitate that bond breaking. Okay? Allow it to be polarized enough that it can break. Okay? One of the big issues to address is that let's say it does break. What happens? Okay, there's two ways that we could break that bond, heterolytically and homolytically. Homolytically means what? 
homolytic bond cleavage means we take the electrons in the bond and they go back to their parent atom, which means we have radicals. What's the issue with radicals? Unstable. They react with everything. Right? We think back to our kind of bulk concepts of fear of biochem. We go, oh, we got to avoid free radicals because free radicals kill you. Okay, free radicals are really important, but we don't want to generate them kind of willy nilly. We want to control their formations. Free radical reactions are generally not a good idea within the body. Okay, so the homolytic bond cleavage is not the best answer. Okay, so how else could we then break it? Well, it's heterolytic, which means the electrons then go to one atom over the other. Okay, in this case, completely arbitrary, because at this point we don't really have a difference between carbon-3 or 4. So if we look at that arrow pushing, what happened to carbon-4? We take the electrons in the bond and we put them on carbon-4. Carbon-4 is now negatively charged, has a lone pair. Can carbon stabilize electrons? No. Okay. Not electronegative, not large, no resonance, no <coughs> real strong inductive effect. Okay. That carbon cannot stabilize the negative. So that's a bad maneuver. We could look at the reverse. What would happen to carbon-3? Okay. If it took the electrons, we run into the same issue. Okay, but let's still assume carbon-4 takes the electrons. What happens to carbon-3? Becomes positive, a cation. Well, could we possibly stabilize a cation? Well, can carbon hold a positive charge? It's a lot better than holding a negative charge because it's not super electronegative. Okay. If we look at what's around that carbon, we have another carbon. So we're forming kind of a primary carbocation. We have an oxygen. What does the oxygen have? Electron pairs. What could those electron pairs potentially do to a positive charge? Could share. Making a double bond, resonant stabilization. So we can potentially break that bond if I can stabilize the anion. The cation is resonant stabilized. The oxygen on either of those carbons can share electrons down and stabilize the carbocation. Okay? So the primary focus in the rest of this is how in, on the planet do we get a stable negative carbon? And that is not easy to do. Okay? So let's start to go through and see what happens in the cell. Okay? <clears throat> Step one, phosphorylation. We take ATP and we put a phosphate group at position 6. Okay. So number one, is it going to be easy to put a phosphate group onto our structure? No. Phosphates on their own are incredibly stable due to resonance. And we talked about this with ATP and ADP. Okay. Because the phosphate's incredibly stable on its own, it does not want to be put onto glucose. So I have to make that phosphate high enough energy that I can slide it onto glucose. How do I do that? The phosphate source is not a free phosphate, but it's a phosphate that comes from ATP. Okay? So the production of ATP to ADP, releasing that phosphate, we talked about it, I think just you two were here. ATP is effectively acting as a cannon. Okay? It is launching that extra phosphate off of it with enough energy, and because the enzyme is now holding it in location, the proper orientation, that that phosphate can hit perfectly into the alcohol uh, position 6 and attach the phosphate to our structure. Okay. So the reaction on its own, not a good reaction to occur. It must happen with ATP. Okay. Because we are transferring a phosphate, the enzyme name used is a kinase. So if we see phosphates moving around, the enzyme name is likely a kinase. Notice we also have something on there with the hexo. What is the hexo in reference to? Six. Where's the six coming from? Glucose has six carbons. This hexo kinase can work with any six carbon carbohydrate. Okay? It just so happens that we use 
glucose as our primary energy source, that's the ones working here. So we could go further and call this a glucokinase. But as our general term, it's just a hexokinase. Do you have names in relation to what it works on the way the structure? Yes. Yes, and you love it or hate it, but yeah. Okay. So the enzyme name can sometimes give you information about what's happening because we named it that way, as opposed to, oh, it looks like this, so let's name it according to what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at the overall change in the structure, the only thing that's happened is we put a phosphate group on. I've included the Fisher projections so that we can go through and see this again. And notice this case, the Fisher projection isn't a big deal. Nothing particularly interesting is here, happening here except that we take that sixth carbon and we attach a phosphate group. That's it. Okay. This first step happens to be one of the control points for, glu for glycolysis. Okay. Why do we reference it as a control point? Well, what's the point of glycolysis? Produce ATP is one of the goals. Okay. Also produce NADH, <coughs> our electron carrier. Okay. Both of those are high energy molecules that can potentially be used to produce more ATP. So the point of glycolysis is to make energy. Okay. What if you already have tons of energy? Then we don't need it. Okay. What if our ATP concentration is very low? This investment is then going to start to become important. Okay. I have to put ATP in, but I can get energy out. Okay. But what if I have absolutely no energy? I can't do this reaction. I'm going to have to use some other form to produce energy. Okay. So we're looking at a very careful balance point. How much energy do I have that I can put some investment in that I can get investment later? or get money back later? Or do I not have anything at all and now I need to get ATP somewhere else? I can't afford to invest it in glycolysis. Okay. So it's an important control point because we're now spending energy to advance. If we don't have that energy to go th forward, then maybe we need to now question whether or not that's a valid step. Okay. So it is an important control step within glycolysis. Step two, okay, isomerization. So if we pretend to ignore the Fischer projections, what changed? As we go from the glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Well, the name changed, so of course we must have an entirely different structure. Sure, it looks different. Okay. Switch it out to the Fischer projections. What changed? Those carbons change their bond characteristic. If we go through and call it one of those our red carbon, the red carbon was what? It looked like you started to mouth it. I was going to say it's an aldehyde right now. <coughs> on, the left. on the left, it's an aldehyde, and where is it on the right? It's a carbon no, it's... it's the same position. It doesn't move. There's our red carbon. It's an alcohol. What type of reaction occurred? Reduction. A reduction. We decreased the number of oxygen bonds. We increased the number of hydrogen bonds. So we actually reduced carbon number one. Okay. If we're going to do a reduction or oxidation, what might we expect to see as some kind of mediator? N NAD plus or H, okay, or FAD. FAD. They aren't there. So this is a bit odd. It looks like we're doing a reduction reaction, and yet we don't have a redox mediator. Hmm. Okay, what's happening to our purple carbon? Yeah, the purple carbon, we oxidized it. So one carbon we reduced, the other carbon we oxidized. The net result is nothing happened.
as far as redox goes. That's why we don't have a redox mediator here, because two things are happening to the same molecule. We're getting both a reduction and an oxidation. The net result is no reduction or oxidation. Okay? That's why we don't need an, a mediator. Okay? So what else is changing within this? How is it potentially going through and doing this change? Okay? And you're welcome, Jimmy. I'm going to pick on you. Okay? And if anybody else remembers, you can jump in too. Okay, just, no, I won't warn you. Carbonyls. What's our chemistry on carbonyls? Uh, an aldehyde is very reactive. Our aldehyde carbon is very reactive as an electrophile, yes. What can you tell me about the purple carbon relative to the carbonyl? Uh, that's your alpha carbon. Your alpha carbon. What do you know about alpha carbons to carbonyls? Uh, they are reactive. Uh, How? If you activate the uh, carbonyl, uh, the alpha hydrogen to a carbonyl oh, yes. is acidic. acidic. Okay. Why is it acidic? If I remove that hydrogen, I should have shifted this further up to draw it. Um, so I'm just going to erase that middle section. If I remove that hydrogen, what happens? I would have a negatively charged carbon. Okay, well, can carbon stabilize a negative charge? Uh, no. no, not electronegative, not big. So that, we would inherently say, is stupid. I can't do that. Okay? But when we're looking at acidity, it's not just the size of the atom. It's not just the electronegativity of the atom. But it's now also shifting to looking at the molecule. Can the molecule stabilize that negative charge? Yes. Yes. How? Resonance. The electrons can move in to forming a pi bond there, but then that necessarily causes that pi bond to break. Okay. And Jimmy, just to give you a preview here, I will be asking you another question. <coughs> and again, somebody else can jump in if you happen to know it. Alpha, beta, unsaturated ketones. Yep. What is that structure? And as a hint, it might be helpful to look at that one. We have an enolate and an enol. What is special on our enolate? So the purple one that I've highlighted is our enolate. Okay, so let's actually break that down. What is being referenced here? What does en mean? Carbon, carbon, double bond. Where's the carbon, carbon, double bond? Yeah, there's one. What does ol mean? Alcohol. We're adding the 8 because in the purple case, I've lost the hydrogen. It's not officially uh, an alcohol. It's the anion form. So that's the name of the 8. So the purple one is an enolate. I have an alkene immediately bound to a negatively charged oxygen. What's happening in the red one? Well, in the red one, I still have an alkene. Whoops. Color code. But it's bound to... An alcohol. I have an enol. Okay. So Mike, just because you said this, I'm just trying to get a background reference on this. Did you take second semester OCHEM? Uh, how long ago? Um, Was that just a, a while ago? Yeah, like a year ago. Okay. The enol, enol late, huge. That's second semester OCHEM. Okay. That discussion should be massive in second semester OCHEM because your OCHEM teacher should be realizing that all of the chemistry that's happening in biochem is based off of the enol enolate relationship. Why does this reaction go? I have to be able to remove that hydrogen. Why does that hydrogen go? I form a resonant stabilized intermediate known as the enolate. That's the only reason this reaction works is because of the enol enolate relationship. You get rid of that relationship, this reaction doesn't work. 
So it is huge in second semester OCHEM. We jump onto the soapbox here real quickly. This is why biochem should have a prerequisite of second semester OCHEM and not just first semester OCHEM. And we'll step back off. Okay. We form this intermediate. Okay. What's interesting about this? Well, it has the ability to go backwards and forwards to the carbonyl versus the enolate form. Okay. Why is this particular inter intermediate interesting? Well, I can go through and form the carbonyl where I originally started it, the purple form, but at the same time, within that same structure, I also have a second enol form. What does that mean? I have the choice of putting the carbonyl either on carbon 1 or on carbon 2. As soon as I remove that hydrogen, that opens up chemistry now where I can shuttle the carbonyl between either of those locations. When we look at the Fisher projection, what ends up happening? Oh, I colored put it backwards. How did I do that? I'm a horrible person. Oh. That's what was screwing me up. <laughs> Let's see if I can stepwise back out of that and color code that more appropriately. Okay. We have our enolate here. And we have our enol here. Okay. So now we're matched to the color to the color of our carbons. Everybody see that a little bit better now? I know, it's still not obvious, but hopefully that helps kind of clarify some of the chemistry. So to get the carbonyl on the purple carbon, all I have to do is remove that hydrogen on the enol. So if I take the electrons from that hydrogen and I dump them into the pi bond to make my carbonyl, now the carbon has too many bonds, so what happens to that double bond? It breaks, and it has to go out and pick up what? Hydrogen. The final stabilization is dumping one more hydrogen onto our enolate anion, and we're right back where we started. All we've really done is shuttled H plus around. Hence, no redox mediator. No electrons exchanged hands, left the molecule, or came into the molecule. All we've done is shuttled the electrons into different locations within the molecule. Hence, no redox. Okay. So, let's open it up. Questions? You're telling me you understand it, or you're just accepting it and saying, okay, I'll move on? <laughs> why would it do that? Okay. So now a good question is, well, why on earth would we cause this shift? Yeah, like what is the point of doing this shift? Remember, our goal was to do what? What did we need to do to our structure? So we got glucose or glucose <laughs> phosphate on our far left. What did we say needed to happen? We needed to break carbon-3, carbon-4 bond. And currently, in glucose, that bond, nonpolar. There's no reason we'd want to cleave that bond. Okay? What happens if we go through an enolate? And we now shift that carbonyl ever so slightly closer. The carbonyl will now start to have an effect on that carbon-3, carbon-4 bond. And we'll actually see that effect in two reactions. Without that shift of the carbonyl, that bond, impossible to cleave. So what causes that shift, though? So what the... I mean... So you, then you start to get back into philosophy and why does anything actually work. Okay. The cell has decided that we need to be able to break that bond. We call it a decision. Okay. <laughs> to get that bond to break... I have to activate the chemistry. I have to somehow facilitate or make that bond more reactive. The way I can make it more reactive is by sliding the carbonyl closer to it. Okay. And through an almost identical relationship, our enol and enolate, 
that bond will break. Okay? But as our structure is in glucose, there is nothing about that bond that makes it particularly reactive. So the enzyme went through, took this structure that generated carbohydrates, said, okay, well, how can I possibly break that bond? There's nothing I can do. I can't just come in and just cut it. It has to have some kind of natural reactivity, and it has none at that stage. If the carbonyl slides ever so slightly closer by one carbon, that bond now becomes activated to do chemistry. And until we see that that <coughs> is actually valid, yeah, why would we shift? Why put the phosphate group on to begin with? Okay, I mean, if we're really going to go down that road, why even put the phosphate on? Okay. Biochemistry has built a pathway to generate energy further on down the road if we can get to those molecules. First, we have to get to those molecules. And we do that by going through a sequence of steps. Okay. And it's not something that is easy enough to do all at once. You can't just say, boop, one enzyme spits it all out and we have all the energy. Okay. Why might it be evolutionarily speaking, a bad idea to have one enzyme just give us tons of energy. What happens if something goes wrong with it? You're dead. Okay. What happens if it now becomes super active? You're dead. You've produced too much energy, and you now overheat, and you combust. Well, that's generally a bad idea. What if it's not active enough? You don't have enough energy. Okay. You want to be able to control each of those stages. If you have only one person working, okay, look at the political system. If we have a king that is awesome, life is great. What happens if the king, king becomes a despot? Life becomes really shitty. So what did we do as a political system? We said kings are a bad idea. We need more people involved so that they can kind of disperse some of that power so that we don't get as confused, okay? Or we don't get as screwed over if one person becomes an evil person, okay? Same thing is happening in biochem. We are building a larger, more complex system so that if something goes wrong, we continue to live. We can work our way around it. All of biochem is doing that same process, okay? When we look at genetic material, we don't go from genetic material directly to protein. Okay, why? Proteins are super, super active. Okay? Need to be constantly being used. If I go directly from DNA to proteins, then what happens? I'm uncoiling my DNA the whole time. If I've got DNA uncoiled the whole time, what happens? Increase the likelihood that I screw up the DNA. Well, if I screw up the DNA, what happens to the proteins? Screws up the proteins, the cell dies. We need something to kind of act as an intermediary to transfer some of that information along so that if something does go wrong, I don't destroy the original copy. I've got something that I can now transition between. So it's putting in checks and balances all the way through. We can't do just one enzyme. This makes things further difficult for us trying to look at it now, because there's thousands of checks and balances. If you only see two of a thousand reactions, you're like, why the hell did you do that? Why don't you just do it in this one step? I'm an organic genius. This is how it should happen. Okay. And we don't see those other checks and balances to realize that we need to break it down into multiple steps. Right? Does that help kind of dodge your question? So how do we get to where then that oxygen um, number next to five, I guess, is now bound to carbon number two? So we have five <coughs> So you're right. If we now look at the ring structure of what's happening here, it looks like, so if we clear, can I clear everything? We're good, at least close enough on the chemistry. Realize that enol is important. That's kind of your big deal. Okay. If we look at how they've got it drawn, we've gone from glucose with a six-membered ring to fructose with a five-membered ring. We're like, well, what the hell happened? Number one, we changed the name. Why did the name change? We didn't change the orientation of really anything within that. Why is it being a different name? Well, remember our nomenclature system for our carbohydrates. Okay, we look at the chiral atoms and say the chiral atoms are organized how? Can we call this glucose anymore? Gluc referred to four chiral atoms alternating, or almost alternating, 
down. Do we have that? No, we only have three chiral atoms now. So we can't refer to that as glucose. We have to call it a different name, even though the same rules kind of held within it. How do we get a five-membered ring? Well, remember, how did we form the ring to begin with? The alcohol on position five reacted with the carbonyl. So when we look at glucose, we took our alcohol at position five and did this, which gets us what kind of a membered ring? One, two, three, four, five, six, a six-membered ring. What happens if I slide that carbonyl one carbon closer? Now when I cyclize, one, two, three, four, five-membered ring. It's going to change the ring structure. Okay, as a necessity of that. We don't have a choice. It's going to happen. He's a ketone now, though. It's generally it's less reactive, but it's still reactive enough. So you're right. We have a ketone now. Why would the ketone go through a cyclization reaction? Okay. Good question. Okay. Should it go through it? Okay. That's going to depend on how the enzyme goes through and deals with its chemistry. Do we form a stable intermediate or a stable product by cyclizing? Five-membered rings are perfectly valid. That is an okay structure to form. Okay. So while you may look at the equilibrium from it, an organic sense of saying straight chain versus five-membered ring, I'd rather be the straight chain, okay. there's a lot more going on in biochem. What is that protein interacting with? It's prob or Sorry, not protein. That carbohydrate interacting with. It is probably interacting with, say, an enzyme. And in that enzyme pocket, what has it done? It's forced it to stay folded up. I should get back to the enzyme too. Yeah. All right. So overall, I'm just going back to this. No, it's okay. Phenol, phenol, um, what did that achieve for us? So what that's achieved so far with our enol enolate is that took the aldehyde and made it a ketone. Okay, by sliding that carbonyl functional group further into the structure. Okay. That's all that's happened. And, that's what okay. we're and we're like, well, why the hell would we do that? And we aren't there yet, but okay. that's setting, setting us up to be able to do the, the thing that we talked about initially, cleaving that carbon-3, carbon-4 bond. Okay. Without sliding that in, we can't do that cleavage. Okay. What do you guys think? So, next step, we might be like, okay, let's see what the hell that whole freaking sliding thing is for. And what do we do in the next step? We go back to a kinase, which then puts a phosphate on. It has nothing to do with the carbonyl. Well, crap. So, what this does do, though, is we're now investing more ATP into this. So, we should immediately be going, well, the whole point of glycolysis was to do what? <coughs> to make energy, make ATP. And so far, every single step that I've looked at has either done jack as far as producing redox mediators, or it's actually consumed energy. This is doing the complete opposite of what I want it to do. Okay, what the hell is going on? Okay, so how and why is this important to look at? Well, I would again argue this is going to go back to trying to set up and breaking that carbon-3-4 bond. Putting the carbonyl there does help us. But what does putting the phosphate out there also do to this bond? Jimmy. Instead of being, what was that? <laughs> oh, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Jimmy. <laughs> this is what you get for having me from organic. Once they cleave, it's going to be more stable, right? Now we have the phosphate on Okay, what is that phosphate going to do? We've put more oxygens out here. Well, what do we know about oxygen? Electronegative. It's very electronegative. So what is it doing to all of the electrons in this side of the molecule? Sucking them into the phosphate, which then means this carbon becomes even more positive. So it's saying, this sucks. What does it need to do? Suck electrons from this carbon. 
Well, this carbon is already kind of screwed because it's got the carbonyl on it with the oxygen directly pulling electrons. It now has another carbon pulling even more electrons. It's saying stuff's get about to get real. I'm going to now start pulling electrons from over here, which then does what? It makes this system now, or that area, much, much, much more reactive than it was before. There's now a very small amount of electron density there. And every single one of those atoms is now fighting for the exact same electrons. So if I put another phosphate on, now it's going to have the effect of pulling it out of space. It's going to pull it even further. So we've now pretty much put something on the bottom end that is ripping electrons away. We've got two things on the top end ripping electrons away. Something's now bound to break. Okay? And that something happens to be our carbon-3, carbon-4 bond. Okay? So in the previous step, does that... The enzyme is breaking the ring, doing what it needs to do, and then putting it back together except for <clears throat> carbon. So I would love to be able to go into details on that, and unfortunately I can't. Um, I can only visualize that happening cleanly in the Fisher projection or with our straight chain form. Dropping it into the ring, that doesn't make it obvious to me. Okay. So what's specifically happening within the enzyme? Well, you'd have to look at the enzyme structure and say, what does the pocket look like? Is the pocket a little ball? Well, if it's a little ball, it's definitely not in a straight chain form. Okay? It's in this coiled form. Okay? In which case, it is probably making and breaking a lot of those bonds very, very rapidly. Okay? My guess is that pocket is kind of ball-shaped, which is why your textbook is showing it in the ring form as opposed to the Fisher projection. Okay. But I don't know. I really don't. Okay. So here we have another ATP investment, which then means also big control point. Okay. The more energy we start dumping into this, the more we're like, wait, why am I putting energy in? I better be getting something useful out of this. So this is another control point within our glycolysis pathway. We want to be able to say, yes, it is worth the investment, or no, it is not. Okay. So we've now switched our structure from being our fructose monophosphate with only a single phosphate to now being fructose bisphosphate because we have two phosphate groups on there. Okay. Again, officially, you're responsible for those full nomenclature, knowing the names of each of those pieces. I have to go back and look at my actual test to see how I've kind of dodged that bullet because I'm not a big fan of just rote memorization on this. Okay. I'd like to see a little bit more th thought kind of behind the questions. Okay. But up to this stage, all we have done is dumped energy in and gotten nothing out of it. The only thing we've done is really polarize <laughs> the middle of that structure. The middle of this structure is now really set and primed and ready to snap. You can think of it of a rubber band. We have now stretched that to the maximum. What happens now? Okay. So let's see what happens. Well, in our next step, uh, sorry, not quite our next step. Uh, this enzyme being a control point, I should have slid this around later when we talked about control points, uh, is an, an important enzyme to go through and study. It ends up being fancy because it's a tetramer, meaning it's made up of four subunits, much like hemoglobin. Hemoglobin was a tetramer as well. Okay, we took four individual subunits. Uh, this enzyme is a little bit more interesting than hemoglobin because those four subunits can be different types of subunits. Okay? Those subunits are referenced as M and as L because the muscle version of phosphofructokinase has slightly different activity than the kinase found in liver. Well, why does that matter? Does our muscle do something different than our liver? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the enzyme has been tweaked through evolution or however you want to look at it to function at different efficiencies depending on what we're trying to get out of it or what we're trying to do. 
Right? So it's neat in that respect because it's a tetramer, and that, that tetramer, depending on where you find that enzyme, has different compositions. So in muscle, it tends to be your highest tetramer concentration tends to be M4. In liver, it tends to be L4. The four is just saying how many of those individual subunits went into it. So on the liver, there's four L-type proteins that went into making that. Right? In the muscle, there's four muscle-type proteins. What if you're somewhere else in the body? Okay. You can end up with a mixture of M-types and L-types. So it's not always just 4M and 4L. You could have 3M and 1L. Okay. So it's kind of neat in that respect. Depending on where you're looking at, you can get varying amounts of each of those subunits into it. The other reason why it's commonly mentioned is it is an allosteric enzyme. It is affected by other things being present, okay, which will change its activity. The particularly interesting one that I was looking at, and I don't know if anybody heard me mumbling over in the corner, okay, was that it is allosterically affected by ATP. Okay. The more ATP that is present, what happens to the activity of the enzyme? It goes down. Okay. Why might that seem weird? For the reaction to work, what does it need? ATP. ATP. So if we increase ATP, this enzyme stops working? That's kind of a bizarre thing to do because you need ATP to get it to work. But if you have too high a concentration of ATP, it actually shuts off. It says, nope, not doing it. Okay. Why? Why might it want to do that? What's going to happen in our later steps? We're going to make ATP. If I already have tons of ATP floating around, there is no point in me even investing it and getting rid of some of it to then make a whole crap ton more. Okay. So it's kind of bizarre because ATP is a reagent, is a chemical necessary for this reaction to go forwards, and yet if I have too much ATP, the reaction shuts off. That's kind of neat. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. What's another piece of that that you might say, yeah, that might have an allosteric effect to prevent it from working? Stop reading the slide. <laughs> What's another molecule that could prevent this molecule or this enzyme from working? Phosphofructokinase. Where it would say, oh, I don't want to do it anymore. ADP. Okay, not a bad idea, but no. Why'd you pick ADP? Because if ATP prevents it, then there's something in there. So we could potentially see ADP. ADP is also a product. If we look at feedback inhibition, products tend to do a feedback loop and shut down enzymes. ADP isn't it, so the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. If there's a large concentration of that species floating around, should I be making more of it? No. Okay. I actually want to stop making it. Okay. So a large concentration of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will also stop the enzyme from working. Okay. If we go through and address that name again, kinase meant phosphate. So we've got a phosphate reaction happening here. Okay. Phosphofructo. What are we starting with? And putting a phosphate on fructose, we aren't actually putting a phosphate on fructose. We're putting a phosphate on Phosphate fructose. There's our phosphofructo. So just like our hexokinase at the very beginning with our um, the glu glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, we're getting the same thing here. We're saying that this kinase is acting by taking that starting material. Okay. The phosphate fructo combination. So again, the enzyme name can help you derive where it's at or what it's doing. <clears throat>
This one's nasty. Here's our massive cleavage. Right? Uh, and finally, they did at least go through a number. You remember, there's our carbon number one. And if we look at our numbering scheme, carbon number one okay, is not our carbonyl compound. Okay. Carbon number four has a carbonyl. Carbon number one just has an alcohol. You'll also notice that when we cleave this, we don't end up with the molecule that I had on the way back when on the previous slide. The molecule that we ended with in the previous slide was what? Just glyceraldehyde phosphate. What the heck is this other piece? Well, take a look at your structure. What are we trying to cleave? Which bond? <coughs> the 3 4 bond. Whoops, sorry. Is this top half the same as this bottom half? No. They're similar, but they're not the same. The top half looks like which of those two molecules? The dihydrohydroxyacetone phosphate. Yeah, exciting name. And the purple one looks like our glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Okay. Which of those two pieces are you like, I see that piece, that's obvious, you don't need to explain that one to me? Is there one? Okay, the top one, so you're saying the dihydroxyacetone? Yeah. Okay. If we compare the dihydroxyacetone, the red box, to the dihydroxyacetone, what's the only thing that changed? The side of the alcohol won't actually be relevant, okay? In our Fisher projections, that's useful if we have a chiral atom. If we look at where the alcohol is, it's not a chiral atom. To be chiral, it has to have four different things. I have two hydrogens there. That's not a chiral atom, okay? So I don't need to care about where I draw the OH. What changed to go from our fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, that top piece, to become dihydroxyacetone? What did I do? Instead of there being a carbon-carbon bond, I made that bond to a hydrogen. That seems pretty straightforward, right? Oh, wait. There it is. Okay. Well, to do that, okay, what charge do you think the hydrogen was? Okay. If it's negative, that's an incredibly unstable species. Okay. We would need to have NADH. Is NADH involved? It's not listed. We don't know. It is not there. Okay, for a good reason. It's not present. No NADH. Okay. So H minus is not going to be our source. We're going to be looking at that hydrogen being positive, which then means that carbon needs to become negative. Is this one of those situations where the, the heterolytic? So it is going to have to do heterolytic cleavage. So that bond in between, this bond, which we'll now draw extra thick there, has to cleave. Those electrons need to go somewhere. So it could hypothetically be negative. Those electrons, if this case is going to be true, if that carbon needs to pick up a hydrogen and that hydrogen should be positively charged because we don't have any DH, that carbon needs to be negative, which means these electrons need to go where? To, the to that carbon. They must go to that carbon. Uh, so I thought it'd be hydride. I thought that would want to be positive. Well, that's okay. what I'm saying. Like, along with Jimmy, like, that could be negative or it could be positive. It could be negative or positive. So the question is then which makes sense or which works. If it's positive, then we have to bring in NADH. Unfortunately, there's no NADH in this reaction. So you came up with a mechanistic idea. It just turned out that when we go to the experiment, that mechanistic idea was wrong. So we change our mechanistic preference and say that it has to be reacting with a positive hydrogen. Okay. Which means when we break that bond, so let's just go through and just cleave that, snap that bond right now. What do we end up with as pieces? <laughs> 
And the other piece, what do we have? Everybody okay with that? I'm just saying P for the phosphate and I wanted all those oxygens. Okay. So that's our theory at this point. For this theory to be valid, what must be true of both of these pieces? They had better both be stable. If they are not stable, does that bond break? No. No. Okay. And this is coming back to what we talked about. Putting the carbonyl in that location is actually what's helping this reaction occur. It's making this negative stable. How? Can carbon hold a negative charge? It is too small and not electronegative enough. The next thing we have to look for is resonance. Those electrons can go up to form a double bond. So they can only go up to here, which would then break that bond should have given myself more space. Our structure would then look like CH2, there's our phosphate. A negative charge on oxygen. Well, can oxygen hold a negative charge? Yes. Yeah, it's electronegative. That can hold. Okay. For those of you, anybody see an, an oh crap moment here? What do we have right there? We have an enolate. Why did this bond break? Because I generate an enolate intermediate. Without that enolate intermediate, this reaction doesn't work. Why did I shift the carbonyl one carbon down? So I can form the resonant stabilized enolate. Without that carbonyl shifting one position closer, I do not get the resonant stabilized intermediate, which means I do not break that bond. Oh, little cell, I see what you did. You made some stable products. That's why you shifted the carbonyl lower. It does not become readily apparent until you see that final step of where it breaks. Now that I have a resonant stabilized intermediate, I'm allowed to break that bond. This is still an intermediate. What then needs to happen? The electrons need to come back down to reform our carbonyl. These electrons come out and pick up Hydrogen, where's the hydrogen coming from? Everybody loves to ask that question. I hate that question. Or really, you hate my answer. NADH is H minus. This is H plus. Anything remotely acidic in the solution. Okay. The really fun answer, the enzyme did it. Your enzyme very likely has an acidic functional group that is sitting there waiting for this structure to now fit into the pocket. And as soon as it starts to see that bond start to stretch just enough, it dumps the hydrogen in there. And now the structure goes, whoop, hey, cool. I can slide things around by doing this real quick resonance and stabilization. Boom, boom, bam, there it is. There's my dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Okay. So the part that you guys said, oh, that's an easy one to see was arguably where all the chemistry heard and probably the hardest to go through and visualize what happened. What happened to the purple piece? Okay, so we draw that back up here. We, whoops, pretend I didn't do that. Uh, wait again. Right? And you're like, well, I don't see how that matches that structure. Well, as a carbocation, can carbon hold a negative charge or a positive charge relatively well? Yes. Not too bad. It's technically a primary carbocation because it's only connected to one other carbon. Primary carbocations, if you remember from organic chem, not good. So it's not a horrible thing, but a primary carbocation, no, bad idea. Can't do that. It's not officially a primary carbocation. What else does this cation have going for it? 
lone pair on the oxygen shares in to make What's the difference now between our structure and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate? I have to get rid of that hydrogen as H plus just regenerated the enzyme catalyst process. So did we not do that? So when we looked at it way back at the very beginning, could we just cleave from glucose, the carbon-3, carbon-4 bond? Is that what you're asking? No, no, no. So right there, that lone pair on the, the structure on the left, the very bottom lone pair. Yes. So instead of going up to the carbon-carbon like we do, could they have just moved over to the... Pick up a hydrogen? Uh, OH. Ooh. And then don't kind of the opposite of what we did on the right, on the right... So, Jimmy, sorry. If anybody else had said that, I might have let you slide with that. I might have let them slide. You do your arrow pushing. What happens? Too many electrons around the oxygen. So, you would have to. Okay. So, can that oxygen, so if, and can the carbon then immediately go out and pick out H plus straight out of solution? Yes, absolutely. The only reason we're drawing that resonance structure is to say that this structure is valid. Okay, even if it does pick up H plus, okay, if that negative isn't stable, it can't form. So it can't immediately go out and pick out H plus because it can't exist. It has to exist first. So we have to prove that it can exist by showing the resonance. Now that we know it can exist, we could show those electrons immediately going out to H plus. But those electrons cannot go into making that carbon-oxygen double bond. Yeah. They exceed the octet. It happens. I'm only mildly disappointed. Oh. <laughs> it's not obvious by any stretch of the imagination. It took me a long time to piece together how these reactions were working. Well, that is obvious now that the lone pairs are there. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, because you didn't see the lone pairs. Yeah. And so this is why when we think back to organic, at least first semester, your instructor usually tells you, draw all your lone pairs. Don't imply them. Don't imply hydrogens. Why? It prevents mistakes like that. As soon as we start implying lone pairs, well, then you go, oh, I can just move them there because it, it, it's missing. Like, no, it's not. They're actually there. Okay. Deep breath. Exciting, right? Okay. So we went through, we took glucose. We actually broke it in half. We went through a massive amount of chemistry to go through and actually do that breakage. Okay. Not particularly easy. And we now end up with two possible molecules. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate and deglyceraldehyde phosphate. Okay. Interestingly enough, when we go back and looked at... I can erase everything, right? One second. Okay, that's fine. What I will do in a second is slide back a few slides to where we just looked at our initial summary. We took glucose to glyceraldehyde phosphate. You'll notice that when I did that, if we look at that slide, there is no mention of dihydroxyacetone. Okay, why is there no mention of the dihydroxyacetone? Because it doesn't do anything. Okay, it's not reactive on the next path. So what do I have to do to the dihydroxyacetone? I have to change it into the reactive form. What's the reactive form? The deglyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Okay. So how could I possibly change it? What's the difference between those two structures? Yes. The relationship between those two is a reduction in oxidation. At one position, I'm reducing. At one position, I'm oxidizing. Which position is that? Two is getting oxidized. Two is getting uh, reduced. reduced. <laughs> and now the question becomes one or three. One or three getting oxidized. Three is getting oxidized. If we think all the way back to our numbering, 
Remember, one was at the opposite end. It's at the opposite end because of that chemistry. As soon as we drop that phosphate on at position one, that prevents it from going through and doing or becoming that carbonyl. Okay. So we are doing, oh, I meant to not ask that. Since we're doing that reduction in oxidation, remember the reduction in oxidation? What was the name of that enzyme? I actually didn't talk about it. That's my fault. It's an isomerase. Okay. The relationship between those two structures, they're isomers of each other. Okay. We aren't changing the number of atoms. Okay. We aren't looking at stereochemistry, really. Okay. All we're doing is changing the location of individual atoms between those two structures. The relationship is that they're is isomers. Well, if we're just switching from one isomer to the other, the name of our enzyme, super creative, is isomerase. Because it's an isomer, and then our ace is our standard enzyme name. Okay. We want to be a little bit more specific, or we could get a little bit more specific within our isomerase name. They call it a triose phosphate. Triose was the name given to a sugar molecule that had three carbons. There are two sugars that have three carbons. Dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde. Okay. Those are our two sugars that allow for this isomerization. Okay. Uh, notice your delta G here. Uh, actually, I'm not sure why I'm pointing that out. Is positive. Okay. What does that mean? requires energy. That's not going to be a favorable reaction. Um, we're looking at probably an equilibrium dependence between these two. Okay, that equilibrium dependence being, do we do anything to dihydroxyacetone phosphate later on? No, we don't do anything to it. What do we do to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate? We convert that into other compounds. According to our equilibrium chemistry, if I remove the product, what happens? It shifts to produce more products. And so we're overcoming that delta G through a Le Chatelier principle. Okay? It's a relatively tiny positive value. Okay? So the equilibrium dynamics is enough to cause that reaction to go. What okay. was the first thing you said about isomerization? You asked us a question about oxidation reduction. So what I was trying to get you to notice is that this reaction here, if we take a look at transitioning, try and do some arrows. If we go from this carbon to this carbon, what changed? Oh, okay. so it's oxidized. That was an oxidation. As we go from this carbon to this carbon, what changed? Reduction. That was a reduction. Have we seen this already? Yeah, okay. That, that process where ultimately where nothing is done. Nothing as far as redox is done. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Is an isomerase. So here's where we saw the same thing, okay, where I, again, think it's easier to see in the Fisher projection on what changed, okay. We took our carbon one and we reduced it, and we took our carbon two and we oxidized it. Same kind of thing was happening in this step five. We took our carbon number one and we oxidized it. We took our carbon number two and we reduced it, okay. So it's the same overall reaction dynamics on what changed. So we're going to expect to use the same named enzyme. Okay. You can almost look at it as a memorization trick. Okay. We're, I'm trying to get you to rec match the name of the enzyme to the chemistry that occurred. Okay. Which I think is a valid way to ask questions on this. I might provide these two structures and say which of these enzymes is responsible for it. And I would probably list isomerase, aldolase, uh, kinase. I'm not creative enough. I think there's some other ones. <laughs> A synthase. Okay. So it's recognizing that what changed, how does that match the name? Okay. Which, for that matter, if we go back, there's the aldolase. Okay. Why do we refer to this as the aldolase? This functional group is that's not right. 
close enough. How to hide and an alcohol. And ultimately going through the keto enol tautomerization, you're referencing an aldol. Okay. It's that aldol formation that's important. Okay. Oh. I'm not sure I have a whole lot of time to go through the rest. Um, so, quick note the slides had you starting with the bisphosphate. Okay. Um, so, I made a quick uh, adjustment on that. I did not start with the biphosphate. Okay. I started with the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate because that's what we're starting with. I just drew the wrong structure or put the wrong structure in there. Okay. Um, what we're going to end up doing now in this kind of next sequence of steps of glycolysis is converting glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate into pyruvate. Okay. So if we look, what big things have changed? So first thing I want to do is kind of erase that ATP. Let's ignore that for the moment. What are the big things, changes? Okay, so we oxidized. Okay, that top was an oxidation reaction. Okay, I heard loss of phosphate. Um, so carbon two increased oxidation, but what happened to carbon three if we're counting from the top? It was reduced. Everybody see that? Okay. So have we done an oxidation and reduction at the same time? Yeah. Done by an isomerase. Okay. Yeah. Nice on the ace and there. You need to include the isomerase. <laughs> the isomer part of that. So we're likely seeing uh, an isomerase being involved in this as well, as a potential. Okay? We're just looking at our big pieces. So if we have a straight oxidation up at the top, what would we expect to be popping up in our reaction? Okay, our NAD plus or NADH. Okay, let's nail that down. Let's be a little bit more careful. If this species was oxidized, what happened to NADH or the NAD species? It had to be it had to be reduced. So we're starting our reaction with and whoa NAD plus, and we're making NADH, not NADH two. H two is with FAD, so it's just NADH. Loss of a phosphate means more than likely a kinase. Yeah, we will likely be using a kinase potentially. Be a little bit careful with that terminology because the kinase is typically putting a phosphate right. on. Right. Yeah, I know we said that things could be reversible. We just got to be a little bit dicey on that. ADP. We're probably starting with ADP going to ATP. ATP. We started with two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. So if we just kind of process through to go through and do this, we're probably going to need two NAD pluses, and we will probably produce two ATPs. Okay. We've used how many so far? Haven't we used four? We only used two. So we used two, and we're only producing two. That so seems that? like a net nothing happened. Oh. But do we remember in glycolysis? What's our result of glycolysis? How much ATP do we produce? Four. You produce four and consume two. two. So there's a net positive in ATP, and yet somehow we don't have that yet. Okay. So something weird's happening. We don't know what it is yet. Okay. Our structure is not making it obvious how we could produce four ATP. Okay. Well, don't we have two of those? For we have two, which gets us two phosphates. That's still two ATP, not four ATP. So we're missing two phosphate groups. Two phosphates are somehow being questionable here. Okay? And that's just because we already know how much ATP is supposed to be produced. Okay? We are definitely well beyond time here, so we need to, to kind of stop. But since you guys were already...